Hello, fellow geography students. This is Ms. Wildy. This is our video lecture over Chapter 12, Industry and Services. I suggest you have your study guide out as well as maybe a um, pen or pencil to write down questions to ask in class if there's something that's confusing or you need further clarification with. You can kind of think about this chapter as being um, three big chunks of information. The first one is about the Industrial Revolution and uh, location theories. Second chunk is about the primary industrial regions of the world. And the third part is more of the modern industrialization and things like post-fortist system, um, off, offshoring or outsourcing, sort of where industry has, has, is, is today and in the future. So um, first key question is where did the Industrial Revolution begin and how did it diffuse? And the Industrial Revolution was a, um, a time period, late 1700s, early 1800s, series of inventions that brought um, new ideas, new technology in terms of energy, in terms of machinery, in terms of um, uh, changing the entire dynamics of the way people worked. Um, prior to this, most people farmed. And with the Industrial Revolution, you have a much higher urbanization, people moving to the cities to work in factories. Um, you have better transportation methods, uh, better energy consumption, um, certainly more pollution as a result. There's not all good, but, um, but it certainly was a time period that um, should be thought of as being very important and, and world changing. So steam engine was very important, iron smelting, water pump, both, all of these things were, were huge innovations for the Industrial Revolution. And, um, and we know that it began in, the in Great Britain in the mid to late, 18, in late 1700s, um, but why? And, and really a lot of it has to do with the fact that Great Britain had so many colonies. So that flow of capital from all of the colonies um, into Great Britain and also into um, Western Europe in general um, caused a, a great deal of money and capital or, and um, um, ideas to spur on the Industrial Revolution. Um, you also have this movement from cottage industries where you have people who just make products within their home, um, moving into connecting with the idea of mercantilism and, and having factories where you want more exports than imports. You have all these resources from the from the colonies, um, and with better machinery, you can put these people instead of in one home or in various homes, you put them in one factory. They can be much more efficient in that. Um, and and all of our cities are located um, around certain resources. One is um, coal fields, and these are going to be. Um, uh, certainly, you're going to find this is our, our um, symbol for the coal fields. So anytime you have lots of coal and rivers and water, you will have that um, steam power, and that's where you're going to have these major industrial cities of Great Britain. Um, Liverpool, Birmingham, Manchester, all of these were very big um, uh, textile and iron production. Um, we also talked about the cast iron bridge constructed in the late 1700s. Huge innovation, revolutionized the way lots of things were made. Um, and in fact, the, the toponym, the name of this town, Iron Bridge, is named for that time. So the diffusion into the rest of Europe, for the most part, um, you have from Great Britain into northern France and then later into central Germany, Czech Republic, um, and or Czechoslovakia at that point, and South Poland. Um, the reasons were the same as with Great Britain. They had access to rivers and coal. Later on, it became important for the, the um, port to be located for trade. So this, the cities that were near a coastline would become the major cities of industrialization. And then further um, developments like the railroad and even more flow of capital from the, from the colonies even um, help spur even more innovations and more diffusion into other areas, like St. Petersburg in Russia, which is the oldest manufacturing city. And its location is, um, again, on a, as a port, um, um, access to Western Europe for trade. Um, and, and so we have this diffusion from Great Britain into France, into Germany, into Poland, and even into Russia. Um, and this is a picture of the uh, Paris Basin, which is the industrial base for France. And Rouen is the city here. It's the head of the navigation point of the Seine River. So we have our river, we have our coal, um, and of course we have our port being for, um, for trade. 
So um, beyond the actual industrial revolution, we need to kind of consider why locations, why, why industries locate where they are. And that's where we come up with our industrial um, location theories. So it's, it's literally just predicting where a business should or will be located. Um, things to consider are variable costs, and there are four variable costs. Resource cost or material cost, labor cost, energy use, and transportation costs. And some of our theorists take some of these more into consideration than others, but those are all the variable costs, things that are going to, to fluctuate or change as, you, um, as your industry grows. You also have to consider the friction of distance, and that's the idea that with the more distance you have, um, you may have less likelihood for trade or for diffusion of that of that um, industry, less likely for it to be, um, uh, I guess, the easiest ways to kind of have it diffused into other areas. So those are some things to consider. And we have three location theories that we focus on in this chapter. Weber's model is the least cost theory. Hotelling's model is the locational interdependence theory. Loesch's model is the zone of profitability. So you need to keep keep in mind just the people, um, the theorists, as well as their theories, and then some, some basic information about it. So Weber's model is the um, model I said focuses on the least cost in terms of transport costs. Agglomeration matters, labor matters, but for a Weber, he said it's most important you, that you that you consider your transportation costs. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. With hoteling, he says that it's more about your agglomeration or your competitors and where they are located. And remember, he's the um, theorist who used the ice cream vendors on the boardwalk. And he said that eventually, if you have two ice cream vendors on either end of the boardwalk, that eventually they will end up in the center together, back to back, because that's the best way that they can make the, the most, um, get as much consumer base as possible. So the locational interdependence is that you are, you are, you can't be self-sufficient. You need to look at your competitors and actually locate near them. And then finally, Loesch, Loesch's model is the zone of profitability, and he's the one that said um, that you need to find your highest cost and your, I mean, your highest income and your lowest cost, and that's where your zone of profitability will be, and that's where you need to maximize your profit. Um, to go back to to Weber a little bit, um, sometimes factories need to locate based on the um, weight and also the distance where you are from your market. So bulk reducing industries, these are these are going to be products where it weighs a lot more as a resource than it does your finished product. That's a bulk reducing industry. And it's going to locate near the resource because that's where the, the highest weight would be and so your transport costs would be more. So like steel making, the iron ore is the actual resource. That's very, very heavy, much heavier than your end product is going to be. So you're going to locate near your resource. But there's another term um, that isn't in our textbook but is, is important for this uh, for this unit and that's the footloose industry. And that's, a, that's an industry or a product where it's going to be minimal transport costs really no matter where you locate because it doesn't, it's just not a huge weight to begin with. So it, like computer software, you don't really need to locate near a resource and you don't need to locate um, where the market is. You can probably be anywhere because most of the time it's being, it's being sold over the internet. Um, and so um, that's a footloose industry. So those kind of things are going to differ on your location. So I wanted to bring those up um, sort of in connection with Weber. Although this, some of this has changed, of course, in more recent with the, with the technology and information um, um, advancement that we've got. This is the model for Loesch. Um, remember, this is that that uh, zone of profitability can, can be found between where your income is going to be the highest and where your cost is going to be the lowest. And that's where you want to locate your industry. All right, so the next major chunk of information is about the industrial regions of the world. Um, and again, the flow of capital um, from these colonies caused more and more expansion to occur, which of course then brought more capital flow. So some of the places that we have for the Industrial Revolution and just, just after that are still major industrial regions of the world today. 
certainly that's true for Western and Central Europe. Again, we talked about those places where you have um, coal and rivers. That's where industrial cities started. There's still major industrial cities there, not necessarily as, much, as strong as they used to be but still there. Um, and the other thing to consider are those ports, those areas along the coast. So if you remember, Jacques Chalet is the one that talks about Rotterdam as, as the like busiest port in the world. Um, that's located here in the Netherlands. And um, it's still very, very important today. It was important in the Dutch Revolution, and it still is today. In terms of North America, again, you want to look at coal, um, but also oil, um, petroleum, um, and the, the um, areas of major manufacturing are located, if you kind of compare these maps, this one and this one, you can kind of see some similarities. Certainly water is important. If you recall, New York City is a major um, break of bulk point because it's got, um, it's got labor force, it's got um, a port, and it's got uh, it's a world city, so the transport transportation is going to be much faster. So people still use it today. Um, whereas we will talk about this a little bit later, but places along within the Midwest that were important for um, for steel or automobile um, industries have now those those businesses have out, outsourced. So that's got a lot of deindustrialization. Um, but again, you're going to have um, you're going to have the resources as being a, a, certainly a part of the manufacturing zone. Um, in terms of steel producers, it's important to look at this chart in the book. China is number one. Japan is number two. Um, so Asia, obviously, and look at these differences. There, that's a big difference. Um, U.S. is three, which is important, and then you have a big a big gap between number three and number four. Um, but again, two of the three countries that are top steel producers are located in Asia, and so those are going to be two primary industrial regions of the world, obviously in steel or um, car manufacturing, certainly for Japan, other, other manufacturing with steel in China. Um, and we did talk about this already. Remember, New York is a break of bulk point. Um, the northeastern United States, lots and lots of, of iron importing. Um, um, and American companies sort of move to um, cluster in one area, and that's called agglomeration. And we have that very much in, in, the, United, in the United States. In terms of Russia, um, Russia has the advantage of having many, many, many rivers. So you'll notice all these different rivers. We have the Don, we have the Volga, we have the Ural River, we have the um, Irtysh, Ob, Yenisei, Lena. All of these are major rivers in Russia. And you have cities that are located right along this. And some of these are major industrial um, uh, cities. Um, remember the... Um, the Nitsky Novgorod right here is considered the Detroit of, of Russia, so major automobile manufacturing here. Um, and you also have the Trans-Siberian Rail Railway, which is also a huge advantage for Russia in terms of industry because it links all of these cities so well. So that's another thing to consider. In terms of East Asia, again, as I said before, China and Japan are going to be huge industrial regions. The Kanto Plain is a major industrial region for Japan. Um, um, to be fair, um, Shenyang is the is sort of the Rust Belt or the Pittsburgh of China, but Beijing and also um, uh, Shanghai has huge development. There is a movement of China trying to move their industrial areas into the hinterlands or this or the central China. So do you know kind of pay, pay attention to that in the future? That's sort of a movement. So how has industrial production changed? Well, you can think of it as two different types of systems. Prior to um, globalization, you have a Fordist system for industry, which is much more about the assembly line. Um, you have a, a moving belt with a product being made along the belt, and each person has one job they're doing over and over and over again. And of course, that's, you know, it's easy to train them. It does help efficiency. Um, However, it's very tedious work. It can cause more um, safety concerns. And it doesn't end up being um, as cost effective as the post forda system. So the post forda system is characterized by its, its global division of labor. So you have different parts of the production process that are done all over the world. And that way you can take advantage of 
um, the cheapest labor or cheapest transport costs or um, export processing zones or, or free trade zones. And so what's happened is the distance doesn't really matter anymore. That's the time-space compression that's occurring because the, the technology and the transportation networks are so efficient that we don't really, it doesn't really matter anymore where things are being made all over the world. The distance doesn't matter um, because you can get things within hours, within, you know, a day or two, anywhere. And so um, you go where your other variable costs, especially labor, are going to be the cheapest. Um, and this and this concept of, of getting something quickly, so you don't have this added inventory stocked up in a warehouse, is called just-in-time delivery. So that you, you don't even need a warehouse, to be honest. You can kind of... Um, um, Easily, if you run out of something, you can easily order it, get it there very quickly, and you don't need to have stocks just piled up. Um, and in fact, that's that's a lot of times what causes problems is if you have this overproduction, like you had during um, the Fordist system. And then, of course, we have our global division of labor, where the corporations corporations are using people from all over the world um, in in the production process. Um, in terms of televisions, the book kind of focuses on televisions for just a little bit. And um, three key elements is that the, the research and design, the manufacturing, and the assembly. And the research and design is what's done in the core, core regions, but the manufacturing and assembly is done in peripheral or semi-peripheral. So again, sort of that movement that, that the core countries use that cheap labor in the peripheral countries to manufacture and to assemble, but that means that the core countries those jobs are now in the tertiary, quaternary, and quinary job, um, uh, sectors of the economy. Um, and so transportation um, um, influences the geography of manufacturing. Um, remember, we talked about containerization, and that's a big deal. Uh, the break of bulk points where you take an item um, from, say, a cargo ship, you take that container and you break it down and put it on the back of trains or trucks to be able to get it around everywhere. That's a break of bulk point. An intermodal connector, again, is very similar. You don't have to break down the container, though. It may, it may be on a train and go through an intermodal connector where it could change to highway or it could change to boat, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, but the transportation of that of of that product or or is going to have influence on where it where it's manufactured. You also have trade agreements like the WTO, free trade, um, no quotas, no limits. So that's gonna that's also gonna have an impact on where you manufacture, and also the energy in the industrial location. Um, this also goes along with the pollutants. Oftentimes you have pollutants, but certain areas of the world will allow you to produce those, or those items or manufacture without any sort of environmental restrictions. So the core becomes high tech. The peripheral is your labor intensive or um, part of the production. So semi-peripheral is somewhat in the middle. It's gonna have some of the, some of the high tech and some of the labor. Um, and those are countries like you find um, Mexico, China, India, um, they're going to be somewhat in the service. Again, a lot of the um, high tech or, or computer um, um, or information technology web, um, not website, excuse me, but companies that we have in the United States use India for their service, for their customer service. It's cheaper labor, they speak English, um, so it, it helps that company out. Um, and that will, you know, that's changing. Semi-peripheral is now getting more and more job skills. They are becoming more core. And so that's going to change as we as we move forward. Um, in terms of top oil producers, and we talked about top steel producers in the world, well, oil producers are also very important. And you'll notice that um, Saudi Arabia is number one. They're an OPEC country, our country in OPEC. Russia is is number two, closely behind Saudi Arabia. It, does, it is not a member of OPEC. So remember, that's to its advantage because it um, it can regulate the price of its oil without competing against other countries or even having to listen to what other countries do, like unlike Saudi Arabia or Iraq or Kuwait or Venezuela that are all members of OPEC. And you also notice that the United States is number three. And actually, these are 2004. Um, if you look at more recent numbers, that those are still about that, but the production is high, higher. So there's still one, two, and three, but the production is higher. 
Um, so just paying attention to that will play a role in the future as well in terms of industry. So um, another question is the major industrial belts in the world today. Um, and we talk about sort of this what the results of this post fornist or global division of labor are happening and what's what's creating what's being created is deindustrialization where because you are sending those manufacturing jobs to other countries for the cheap labor those places that used to be in core countries that used to be major industrial re regions are now lost the unemployment rate is high people have moved away um, it's a it's sort of a dilapidated part so so again we've talked about the rust belt with like detroit or pittsburgh the rust belt of of the united states you can also say that there are sort of rust belts of europe as well and so this is liver this is a picture of liver liverpool england where it used to be a huge manufacturing town and now because of outsourcing it's no longer um and and china is also you know major industrial leader of the world and it's the place where those those uh, jobs have gone to China India Mexico again um, so you so deindustrialization is sort of a, a negative for um, for the outsourcing because even though it you know it certainly brings jobs to those peripheral countries or semi peripheral countries it creates job loss in the core countries um, so again, China is a major industrial growth after 1950, um, and um, they are even further developing their industrialization, wanting to move into that that hinterland or the middle part um, because it's cheaper labor for them. Um, and the other thing that China offers for other com companies is, or countries, excuse me, is the SEZs or special economic zones, where you do not have um, environmental restrictions, you have free trade, you have cheap labor, um, and um, Shanghai has become the second industrial district in China um, as a result of that. Um, so again, you, obviously in China, they're they're growing, they're building, and you have. Um, people moving into those kind of jobs, but there may also be neighborhoods that have sort of been destroyed as a result of it. So that history um, comes into play. Your, your, your cultural landscape will be changing. Um, in terms of the service economy and where services are concentrated, again, we've talked about this. Service, service economy is, is your tertiary jobs, your, your, um, um, your service industry jobs, and those are going to be much more found in the core countries versus the primary and secondary jobs or sector jobs, which are going to be found in the peripheral or semi-peripheral. Um, you also have um, information technology that's really taken off again with our with our um, time space compression or space space time compression. Um, less tied to energy sources and more about your market. Um, and so this moves us into um, these information technology technopoles or um, um, areas where certain companies locate and that causes other businesses to locate there. So with Walmart, Bentonville, Arkansas is their headquarters. It's a little tiny town in Arkansas, not really worth much, but because Walmart requires all of the companies that put products in their stores to come visit them in their office, now other companies are locating in Bentonville, Arkansas, or right around, like Procter & Gamble is in Fayetteville, and other businesses have started to locate near Walmart so they can, they can have that advantage of locating near their, their um, huge buyer. Um, the other thing that this brings up the field note is, is Nike. Nike was headquartered in Oregon, however, Oregon does no longer makes the shoes. They're now all over the world in that global division of labor, and um, so just because you, you know where it's headquartered doesn't necessarily mean that that's where it's actually being produced anymore because of that global division of labor. So again, outsourcing is where you're moving individual steps in the production process to another um, area. Um, and that may just be within the same country, but um, um, it, it is uh, focusing on lowering your costs. So we've talked about this in terms of the Sun Belt. Lots of industries have located in the Sun Belt because it is cheaper, usually cheaper taxes, cheaper um, price of living, more temperate climate, all those different things are why they're outsourcing is happening. And then offshoring is when you're taking that work and putting it in a different country, obviously for the lower taxes or lower um, labor costs. 
And then again, we have our high-tech corridors, like I was talking about just a second. Silicon Valley is where um, you have uh, Microsoft and um, Netscape and all of these different computer technology. They all locate near each other as an agglomeration um, so that they can help basically feed off each other's labor. Um, because people are skilled in high technology jobs, then then other countries companies want to locate near that so that when they can maybe recruit those high skilled labor. Um, and a technopole is somewhat similar. It's usually um, technology companies. And they'll occur they'll they'll locate near universities so that they can um, again get recruits right out of college or right out of the university that are very um, very knowledgeable about the industry and the, t and the technology um, and um, and can use that for their labor. And one of the examples there is that Route 128 corridor in Boston, which is near um, MIT. So um, um, in Dallas, they talk about Plano and Richardson. That's the telecom corridor. And again, located near these um, universities and um, agglomerate agglomeration of um, different companies all located in one place. So that sums up our um, industry uh, PowerPoint or video lecture. I hope this helps you. Um, thank you so much. Bye.